You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. The Corporate Transparency Act. You may have heard about it, but if you haven't, you need to, especially if you have an LLC or any other entity. Because if you do not comply with the new regulations, there could be a $10,000 fine per entity plus two years in jail. Yes, you heard that right. Two years in jail for simply not telling the government who you are if, if you are the owner of the LLC. I'm Kathy Fetke. Welcome to The Real Well Show. I just got back from a ski trip chasing the Tahoe storm, so that's why I got the hat on. Plus, it's really cold here today. But I didn't want to wait to bring you this information from my friend Mauricio Rauld from the Premier Law Group. Mauricio is a securities attorney helping real estate investors raise capital legally to help you stay out of jail that way. And he's here today to explain how you can stay compliant with your LLCs because this is a new ruling started this year and you don't have much time to be compliant. Mauricio, welcome back to The Real Well Show. Thanks for having me, Kathy. Always good to see you. Good to see you. I've got my uh, winter stuff on. <laughs> I <laughs> love think, it. I you thought think... you were like I thought you were like in uh, you know Aspen or something or or. or I just got back from Tahoe. I chased the storm. It was the biggest storm of the year, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'm still in the in the in the ski clothes. Love it. Love it. <laughs> it was it was a little too windy for it to be the great powder I was seeking, mm. but it was still lots of fun. Cool. Anyway. Let's talk about a blizzard in the, uh, basically, in the <laughs> nice entity world. Kathy, nice transition, Nice <laughs> transition. <laughs> so we've got this Corporate Transparency Act. I haven't talked too much about that here, but let's talk. What, what is it? What is that that we should yeah. be concerned about? Yeah. So this is this has been in the works for a couple of years now, and it, it officially became effective January 1st of this year. And it's a pretty onerous requirement that's placed on anybody who ever has had or, or has today some kind of an entity that they filed somewhere. So if you have an LLC, if you have a limited partnership, you have a corporation, you have an S corporation, anything that you filed. So for us real estate investors, it's, it's likely that you have an LLC that you've placed your property into, then this applies to you. And what the government has been trying to do is sort of prevent what they call, you know, nefarious activities and money laundering and tax evasion, all this fun stuff. And so they will ultimately want to know who the ultimate owners are all, of all, all, all these companies. Because obviously you can put layer upon layer and you can have privacy in some of these states. We, I know we've talked about that before. And so they just want to know who's who. That's really at the end of the day what they want to do. And so what they passed was this thing called the Corporate Transparency Act, which is uh, enforced by one of the government agencies called FinCEN, the Financial uh, Crimes Enforcement Network, really woo name, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And it essentially requires you to provide the government with certain personal information, right? And, and it really applies to three separate categories. But the main one, let's talk about the main one, because if you are an owner, a beneficial owner of any of these entities, and I'll get to what that means in a second, you have to provide the government with your name, with your home address, not a business or PO box, your home address, your date of birth, uh, some kind of an identifying number, which is usually, you know, it's like a driver's license or a passport number or something like that. That's kind of an ID. Uh, and also you have to upload a copy of that driver's license uh, or uh, passport. And um, and so that applies to anybody who's a beneficial owner of one of these entities. And a beneficial owner is defined as anybody who has a 25 percent ownership in the company. So if you're a 25 percent owner or more. Or you have what's called substantial control over the company or the entity. So if you're the manager or if you have a huge, you know, 50% plus one voting block, even though you may not technically have, you know, you may have a 20% ownership, but you have a 55% or 51% uh, 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 voting block, which happens a lot in my world with, with the syndication. So you, you may not have more than 25%, but you certainly have voting power. Uh, so any of those folks, beneficial owners, must, must report this to the government within 90 days. This year, it's 90 days of filing your entity with the state. Um, starting next year, it'll be 30 days. You'll have 30 days to file. Uh, and that's for all of the entities that were filed this year. So as of January 1st of this year, moving forward, you have this 90-day period. For entities that have been done in the past, meaning go all the way back to however long you have had LLC. So if you've had a property for 20 years and it's been an LLC for the last 20 years and you have that LLC, then you have until the end of the year to get all of your filings caught up to date. Because as you can imagine, I have a lot of clients that have Literally, I have one client that has over 100 
entities, right? They have a lot of, in, a lot of yeah, real estate. Probably close but, to that know. at this point. So, <laughs> so that's going to take a while to un untangle. But yeah, so that's kind of the, the gist of it. And everybody's been up in arms and, and nobody really likes it because it's onerous, right? It just adds compliance, which means it adds cost and adds complexity. And that's the last thing small business owners want. What happens if you just don't do it? There are pretty egregious penalties. That's, that's a great question. So if you don't do it, the government is going to charge you on the civil side for $500 per day per infraction, right? Ooh. So it's pretty onerous. Now, there's some debate as to whether that's capped at $10,000. i am not so sure it is. So it's a little bit vague where the statute is and obviously just came out, so we don't have any guidance. But the way I read it is it's $500 per day with no, no description of a limit. And on the criminal side, you can get fined up to $10,000 and two years in prison. Right. And if you really are egregious and willfully do it and you're really trying to avoid the law, that can go up to five years in prison and two, I think $250,000. So they're not messing around. So it's not something I would take lightly and just decide not to file. Um, and, and, it, and it causes issues because a lot of times you don't even control, you know, you've got a bunch of partners. They don't want to give you the information. It's like, well, you know, how do I file this if my partner doesn't want to give me their home address or doesn't want to give me their driver's license? So it's creating a lot of problems. Yeah, right. I can imagine. But <laughs> Recently, there was a lawsuit around this, right? Yeah, of course. So everybody's been up in arms. Everybody's like, well, how is this legal? How do they have the power? It's invasion of privacy. It's, they're, you know, it's my, they're invading my uh, constitutional rights, all this at the other. And nobody's really done much about it except uh, a little known, I don't know if it's little known. I didn't actually know about it, but there's a company or an organization called the National Small Business Association. The National, not the SBA, but the National Small, Small Business Association. They have about 60,000 members and they actually filed a lawsuit a couple of years ago, which I actually was not aware of. Uh, until last Friday, because last Friday, on March 1st, a uh, federal judge in uh, the district of, in Alabama uh, found that this law was unconstitutional. They said that Congress overstepped their boundaries. They don't have the power to pass this kind of a legislation. The judge gave its reasons. We don't need to get into sort of the details. But at the end of the day, the judge said, hey, this is an unconstitutional law and basically banned the government from enforcing the law against the particular plaintiffs. And I think that's where people have gotten a little bit carried away because they see, oh, it's unconstitutional. They say, oh, it's been overturned. And that's not really how it works. And I'm, and I'm happy to get, you know, as obviously as an attorney and a former litigation attorney, I, I, I understand how the process works. But this does not mean that the law is no longer valid. In fact, FinCEN, the government came out with a statement on Monday, which is what I expected, that basically said, hey, we're going to respect the judge's order. We obviously disagree with the order, but we're going to respect the judge's order and not enforce the Corporate Transparency Act against the specific plaintiffs, which again was one individual and then this National Small Business Association. So unless you were a member of the National Small Business Association as of March 1st, this, this doesn't actually apply to you. Oh boy, so, everybody would start joining right now, wouldn't they? <laughs> I, I, got, I, did, I did my live on Monday and I said, like, I, I, we hadn't heard anything from FinCEN yet. And, I, and somebody asked me that question. And I said, I can't, I can't imagine that, that that's the way it was. And obviously it's not. You have to have it by, by March 1st. Otherwise, the membership of the small business, it would have been like the large, uh, <laughs> large business association. Right. By the time we're done. Yeah, um, I'll have to ask Rich if for some reason he joined that. I very much doubt it. <laughs> So, so wow. right now, if you, you know, if you filed something this year, right, if you've set up an LLC or something this year, you obviously had 90 days, so you're going to have till the end of March to get that file. I would not, you know, this is, this is not, obviously I'm not anybody's attorney, but I'm recommending that our, our clients go ahead and file it because if somebody, you know, if like we're, you know, we're in California, right? So, so this is a, this is a judge in Alabama. It's a district court in Alabama. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have any bearing on a court here in California. So if I, you know, bring a, a lawsuit against the government here in California and, and a judge hears it. They can take into account the judge in Alabama and their reasoning, but they're not bound by that by that decision. And so what's going to happen is that the government's going to appeal that decision. And, and remember, not to get too nerdy on this, uh, Kathy, but remember, we have kind of a dual system here in the United States. We have a state system and a federal. This is in federal court. And so when an appeals happen, it goes up the federal system, which is the, the circuit, uh, the circuit level. So the 11th circuit is the one that will hear the opinion. Luckily, that that circuit is actually pretty conservative. So I think the odds of this getting upheld are relatively high. Uh, but again, it's not binding on, you know, the Ninth Circuit here in California, and right? it's not binding on the Second Circuit. It, it's not binding on anyone. And so what I'm expecting to happen is that you're going to see all these lawsuits drop popping up and different judges and different courts uh, are probably going to have different opinions. And one's going to say it's constitutional. One's going to say it's not. And depending on what jurisdiction you fit into, it may or may not apply to you. And eventually it's going to have to make its way up all the way up to the next level, which obviously is the U.S. Supreme Court, and they'll have to settle this once and for all and let us know whether Congress overstepped their boundaries. And if they say that, then yes, at that point, you're done, no longer enforceable. But in the meantime, 
uh, it's not like you're going to get away from filing all the stuff. You got to continue doing it. Well, especially for anything that was formed this year, right? For the old ones, you have a little bit more time. Yeah. So it, it, this whole thing, though, that's a, good, that's a great point, Kathy, is that these things take time. I mean, it, it, the court process, it just takes forever. I mean, we're dealing with some stuff that I've been following here in California. And it's like by the time it gets to the, to the, to the circuit and it gets it, it just takes like sometimes years to do. So, yes, I would probably if you can and you don't have too many, I would probably hold off on filing you don't be the a student get everything filed ahead of time like wait if you filed some if you have an entity from last year or before you have till the end of the year to file so maybe you want to wait until september october november to get that process going depending on how many entities you have but honestly will everything be settled by the end of the year no uh (laughs) but you never know the fincen may come out or the government may reconsider and say hey look while this is all this uncertainty is going on we're going to stop enforcing it until the process goes on but it's usually the other way around. Usually the order is stayed pending the appeal. And so everything goes on as usual until, you know, it makes its way up the court. So a lot of people are getting excited about this, about, oh, it's we don't have to do anything. It's unconstitutional. We just have one judge, a conservative judge in, in the state of Alabama. And by the way, you can pick where you file these lawsuits. So these guys aren't idiots, right? They found a they picked a jurisdiction that had a, <laughs> you know, a good chance of having a conservative judge that was going to be sympathetic. Uh, and again, the 11th Circuit, I think, will also be sympathetic, but that doesn't mean all the other jurisdictions around the country will agree. Got it. So we get these entities, these LLCs, for several reasons, right? Yeah, for asset protection, for privacy, but mainly if there's a lawsuit that you're you're somewhat protected, there's you have limited liability. Yeah, D- that all still stands. Oh, 100. percent The only thing that this really affects is the. Uh, obligation to provide the government with certain private information. So a lot of people are sort of up in arms about the privacy issue. By the way, this is, at least as the statute's written, it, it's not available to anybody else. So if you get into a, a dispute with your neighbor or you get into a car accident and somebody's trying to sue you, in theory anyway, they're not able to get a hold of this information. It's very similar to your tax returns, right? If you have tax returns, obviously the, the government has that information, the IRS has that information, but in theory, you know, it's very difficult, not impossible, but it's very difficult to get a copy of that because of the privacy and all that stuff. So it doesn't affect any of that. And again, I would argue it doesn't even affect the privacy part, which isn't privacy is not an absolute asset protection uh, thing. It's a good strategy because it's obviously if you don't know who's who, it's hard to to sue everyone. But um, it's everything else still applies. The, the, the only thing this really does affect is your necessity to, to provide the government and the, you know, the FBI and the, you know, all these governmental agencies, the police and everything, this information that's going to go on some database that they're all going to have access to your date of birth and your, your home address and all that stuff. And some people don't care. Some people are like, Hey, who cares? The government probably has all that stuff anyway. I've got an FBI file and they have it anyway. So who cares? And then other people are up in arms saying this is an invasion of privacy. How dare the government overstep their boundaries and request me to give all this, you know, personal information that they're not entitled to. Yeah, I'm in the camp of I don't care. I mean, is there is there a benefit? Are we going to catch the bad guys this way? I mean, <laughs> the mund- money laundering and such? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, it's like, uh, not really. I mean, I think uh, um, I, I don't think so. I, I you know, so it's really not me. doing anything. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to do. I mean, it's it, it, it all I do know. I do know what it is going to do. And it is already happening. So one of the things I didn't kind of talk about at the beginning, because I wanted to get to the meat of it. But there's actually three categories of people that have to file. Right. So it's not only the beneficial owners, the reporting company itself has to do a filing. So the LLC itself would have to do a filing, which is not a big deal. But the third category is a big deal. And that's people like me. So people who actually file these entities, you know, on behalf of their clients, whether it's a law firm or whether it's one of these, you know, like LegalZoom or, you know, Inkfile, one of these big outfits, they also are required to make sure that they provide all this information. And if they don't, they're going to be liable. So in my case, when I file LLCs for my client, if I don't get all the information from the clients and fail to file with FinCEN within the 90 day period, then I'm going to be on the hook for the $500 and all that stuff. So Mm. what you're seeing is in our case, and I think I I talked to many people that are doing something similar, like we're not going to file anything for you. Like for Kathy, Kathy, you came to say, Mauricio, I need an LLC file. I would say, well, Kathy, great. I need all this information, you know, your, your address, your date of birth, your driver's license, all that stuff before I file it. Because if I don't have that information and I file it and then I say, okay, Kathy, give me the info. And you're like, hmm, I don't know. I don't, or you give me false information or whatever. I'm stuck and I'm going to be on the hook for it. So wow. filers are now being very careful about gathering the information, which causes a delay, not to mention the additional work, which will mean the cost of creating these LLCs are going to be going up. I mean, we've already increased pricing because, you know, it takes time to go 
gather all this information and make the filings and, and all that stuff. So you're going to see that hidden cost. I saw a statistic in the, in the, um, in the court order that it was, I think they said like $8,000 per year. And comp- I don't know where that number comes from. That seems really high. But, you know, if you were able to get an entity filed by one of these companies for, you know, six, seven hundred dollars, well, that might be a thousand dollars, right? Because they have to do all this additional work. So it does affect the filers. And um, it, that's just something to keep in mind of. If you're looking to get something really fast, just make sure you have all your info ahead of time because they're most likely going to ask for that before they move a finger. Ooh, okay. So just a little bit more paperwork for everybody for it doesn't sound like a really great result if we're not uh, getting, I mean, I'm assuming they are doing, I mean, what was the intention? Uh, why, why are we doing this? Um, again, they're claiming, you know, I don't, you know, everybody asked me that. I'm like, look, I don't know what Congress is thinking. And, you know, in fact, I, I, if I remember correctly, President Trump tried to actually, it was during the Trump administration, he tried to overturn. It's part of a larger bill. It's like these bills are so ginormous that this is like one piece of a much larger, uh, you know, bill. But um, I mean, look, they're obviously they're they're hurting for money. So they think that there's a lot of people that are hiding, uh, hiding money, whether it's foreigners or locals. And that's a way to get around taxes. And I guess they're concerned about money laundering. And, and again, they just want to get their money, I guess. And at the end of the day, that's what they're trying to make sure that everybody's exposed. And I know exactly who owns this company and we can't start creating these shell companies or these, you know, in some countries, you're going to use bearer shares where technically you own the company, but you're nowhere on a title or you're nowhere as the manager, but you're pulling the strings. And so they just want to gather that mm-hmm. information to know to make sure that, you know, they know who owns this company that owns all these assets. So to make sure they're paying their taxes properly and not, not evading taxes. So if we're stuck with this, I'm just going to hope that there is a really good benefit and that they do <laughs> yeah. indeed find those people. All right. Okay. So I know you got to go, but one last question. Yeah. You know, we get, we spend all this money and do all these things to have this asset protection. And then it's so easy to mess it up. <laughs> you know, yes. it's so easy. Yes. You, just because you have an LLC doesn't mean it's going to protect you yes. if you're not uh, managing it well. Yes. So what are some of the ways that that corporate veil is pierced? The, the 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 number one way a corporate veil is pierced is when you start commingling the activities of the company and your personal activity. So if you don't have separate bank accounts, if you start using your corporate card to buy the groceries, or you pay, or you use your personal card to use some of the stuff, and you just don't respect those boundaries, that's going to be the easiest way for somebody to pierce a corporate veil. Um, you you want to make sure that you respect those boundaries and you treat them as separate companies. And a lot of times, I know that's. That's a pain, right? Because it's like, well, I don't, do I, do I need to set up another bank account? I don't really, I've already got a bunch of entities. I don't want to set up another bank account. I don't want to get another EIN. Uh, it's just easier for me to move money from company A to company B. Why do I have to move it this other way? It seems like, like all those things people are trying to avoid. But the reason you're doing that is you want to, you want to keep that in that, that separation intact. And, uh, that's probably the number one reason, uh, people lose that, that corporate veil. The other one is just not properly, uh, funding the entity. Like you, you can't just create an LLC, put an asset in there and n- not properly fund it so that there's really no expectation if something w- were to happen that you didn't have some kind of a, a way of paying for it. So at the very least, you want to capitalize the entity with some sort of capital, uh, or at least have an insurance policy. So on the real estate side, the way I would satisfy that is just get an insurance policy. So at least, by the way, insurance is always your first line of defense anyway. So if something were to happen, tenant slips and falls or some kind of a dispute with the property owner, that there's an insurance policy first to, 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 um, to be able to handle those claims. And if the insurance policy isn't enough because the, the claim is much bigger or maybe there's an exemption or a, a hole in the policy, which often happens, right, that you have a backstop and that backstop is the LLC. But uh, you want to make sure you, cap- you sufficiently capitalize the LLC to, to maintain that. But I think those are probably the two, the two main ways uh, that, uh, that, that, that the corporate bail gets pierced. Yeah, and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, having your asset protection attorney in communication with your accountant or CPA, because oh, okay. someone just came to me recently and said, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're just uh, putting all of our properties in this one LLC, even though they're not really on title for that. That the the, uh, the LLC doesn't actually own that property because oh, it's that, not yeah. on title. Yeah, that's, like, that, that's one of my. You know, there's. Uh, you know, I always come up with these the top. Top things to do, you know, after, you know, because everybody sets up the LLC and there's a lot of things to think about beforehand. Like, you know, where do you set it up? Who should be the owner? Who should be the manager? How does the cash flow run? There's a lot of those questions before you set up the entity. But then when you come to the list of what you should do after you set up the entity, the number one thing you need to do is transfer the asset into the entity. Because if you don't do that, (laughs) no amount of planning and entities and structure is going to help you. You have to do that and transfer that. 
uh, that property, in our case, obviously it's real estate, you want to transfer that. And you'd, you'd be surprised how many people we, we've created LLCs for. And then a year later, I hear that, oh, I haven't gotten around to, to transferring the property, you know, and it's not <laughs> super complicated. It's just, you know, a transfer deed, you know, follow it yeah. with the county recorder's office. But yeah, that's going to be step one. And then I would say step two is get that EIN, that tax identification number for the, even if you're never going to use the bank account and for whatever reason, get it. So you're saying, hey, the EIN company is separate from my social security number. We have separate companies and then open up a bank account too. That's another way just to show the separation and make sure all the income and expenses are run through that bank account and not, you know, shortcut through some other mechanism. You almost have to have it in your mind, like your LLC is a, is your client or it's another person. It's not you. And you just can't be, I, I, yeah. th- I've seen this and it was just, just recently last week. Someone was like, oh yeah, we just have all the cash flow from the property go into that LLC, but they never put, <laughs> they never put it on title. It's, you know, and- <laughs> the, the actual creation of the LLC is obviously fairly straightforward. I mean, you can have somebody relative, you know, you can get one of these, you know, low cost filing, or you can do it yourself sometimes, you know, but th- it's all the other questions that you really want to have somebody who knows what they're doing in terms of, like I said, where question number one, where should I set, set up this LLC? And, and part of that depends on what type of an LLC is it? Is it an LLC that's holding property here in California, for example? Because if that's the case, it's, it's going to have to be here in California. Or is it a management company that's, that's the manager of your LLC or it's an operational company? Or is it maybe a holding company that doesn't do anything and simply owns the LLC? So depending on what type of entity it is will dictate what state you're going to file in it, because some states are obviously better from an asset protection standpoint than others. But depending on the type of entity, you may not have an option. Like if you have a business like we do here in California, we're doing business in California, we're going to have to yeah. file it in California. But we, there's other strategies we can implement. So all those questions before you file and getting that information, once you have all that information, then you can just go do it yourself or you can do whatever. But it's that that intel of figuring out where to file it, who's going to own it, who's going to manage it, what's all these relationships between this entity and your other entities. That gets a little bit more complex uh, to gather the information, you know, before you file something. Yeah, don't do not do it on your own. Don't do it on your own. You need an expert. <laughs> That's what you guys are here. <laughs> I, I imagine you went to, to law school and have been helping many, many clients with this uh, I'm a reco- so as you know, Kathy. I mean, you, you and I have known each other for for, for we, we won't say how long we've known each other. It's been a long, long time. But I, I'm a recovering asset protection attorney. So I used to do this quite a bit back in the day. I don't do it anymore. I really my practice focuses almost exclusively now on the syndication part and helping you know real estate investors raise capital properly. But that's why you know I get a lot of these questions. So I ended up just writing a book primarily about asset protection, which is this legal strategies for everyone book. And I talk a lot about entity formations and LLCs and privacy and all of these kind of the different layers of asset protection. Because again, not everybody needs some fancy asset protection trusts and equity stripping strategy, but then other people having an insurance policy alone is not going to cut it either, right? So there's, it's somewhere in between. And so, you know, I kind of walk people through all that stuff, uh, sort of these six layers. What's the name of the book? It's called Legal Strategies for Everyone. Uh, oh, I'm going to read it. I can't yeah, believe yeah. I haven't read that yet. Wonderful. Yeah, it's, uh, it's we, got, we set up a website. We, Kathy, we set up a website and everything. Legal oh, Strategies for Everyone.com. It's actually through, uh, you know, Ken McElroy, uh, KM Press. So uh, yeah. pretty, pretty okay. stoked to be uh, associated with Kenny as, as always. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Book just yeah, launched wonderful. Last week. So, yeah. so, so great. Okay. And so we'll have you back to talk about what you do now, which is helping people raise money properly and doing JV agreements versus syndication. Make sure you do it yes. right. Bottom line, anytime you're taking investor money, it's a security, right? If, if, if they're passive. Especially when you're doing all the work. That's the key. If you're generating the returns and putting all the sweat equity in and they're just writing you a check, there's just no way around it. It's a security. Yeah. And call Mauricio so you don't get in trouble. <laughs> all right. Thank you for being here on The Real Well Show. So good to see you. Great to see you, Kathy, as always. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. You can go to realwealthshow.com for more information. And when you're there, you get access to over 500 free webinars, just like this one, to help you on your real estate investing journey. I'm Kathy Fetke. Thanks again for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. And we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.